Life is hectic, demanding, and doesn't stop. When honest with ourselves, we must confess we often don't know what the hell we're doing. The LARCast is an ongoing conversation about the inclusive and mischievous nature of God's presence through the lens of all the things that make up this phenomenon we refer to as life. Astonishing grace and refreshing honesty collide right here for your weekly encouragement. Welcome back to the LARCast. Tony here. Russ is with me. What's up, Russ? How you doing, man? Yeah, buddy. Good. Doing good, man. Glad to hop on here. Got a good conversation in front of us. Yeah, I'm excited about this one. Um, really quick, I, I can't let the opportunity pass uh, to let our audience know that the uh, the Major League Baseball teams that we both root for are really the top two teams in the American League. Um, the they Rays are. having lots of success recently uh, a lot more than my chicago white Sox, but um the rays and Sox met up in chicago for a series recently and um my boys my boys here the socks they eked they eked one out they uh they came up, that, they came up that, on top got that got that run in that 10th inning crazy man good series yeah yeah, Usually I've been hearing people say for a while they're the best two teams in baseball. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Well, the National League definitely has some good teams, but I didn't want to just solely show love to Chicago because you know I love Tampa. So I had to, I had to wear yeah. my King, I had to wear my King State shirt today just to kind of represent my love for Tampa for you and then also the Sox. So, man, I appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. I don't have anything to show today other than um well I do have this coffee from Starbucks. From store Starbucks? From Starbucks. Four Stray, bucks. Stray bucks. I call, it, I call it four bucks. And uh yeah, my daughter, Emily, she works there. And so every now and then I get a chance to drive through there when she's working, say hello, give a shout out to her. She gives me a little discount, a little That's dad awesome. discount. I miss Emily. Shout out to Emily. Yeah, she's great. Club Ginger. Club Ginger, me and Russ's, well, two out of his three kids. We'll see what yep. Eli's up to. He's got straight. <laughs> Eli's like me made over when he was little. <laughs> He's got the the dirty blonde going on. Yep. But uh, yeah, man, no, the baseball season has been enjoyable. It's always good when your team is good. It just makes it, you know, all the more better. It's kind of like my softball season this year. I know we haven't got into my softball uh, escapades in, you know, this season of mm. the, the podcast, they moved me to a uh, pitcher. They were not, uh, they were not happy with my per- defensive performance at first base. Mm. As noted, yeah. as, as noted in the last uh, podcast or a couple ago, I can, I can move pretty quick. Once I get going, it's that initial, what they call the quickness. I don't have, yeah. I don't have the quickness. Yeah. Yeah. When you get all that, all that you going, you know what I mean? Like it, it starts rolling. <laughs> it's like, a, it's like a train. The it's like a train. The town, the town train. Initial like. <laughs> right. And that, <laughs> and that train, how that train starts getting going, man. You know, they say that they move people to pitcher <laughs> because they don't have to like in softball, like older men leagues. They say you go to pitcher basically when you're like, you're not really good at like defense, but they don't need you to be. They just like, if you could just block the ball with your body because it's moving so <laughs> fast when it comes at you. <laughs> so hey, thank you. Okay. We're getting dinged. <laughs> Let's so thank, you. thank you for introducing that because. That's the one hesitancy of um, being a pitcher in a slow pitch softball is uh, you, you're probably going to get dinged. And um, mm. yeah, that happened this past week. Um, what's crazy yeah, is it happened while the one dude I knew who's a supporter of Lark, like he loves what we're doing. Friend of mine out here. 
Bro. He's up to bat. He's batting second. I send him a pitch right down the middle of the plate. Sends up, sends this ball back right at my flipping knee at like 80 miles an hour, just screaming. Yeah. Oh, it sucked so bad. It sucked so bad. It was like, you know, it was one of those with like your quickness. Game. You jumped in the air like a cat <laughs> and it went right under you, didn't it? The whole game stopped. Everyone's like, dude, are you okay? Oh, man. I definitely got that. Oh, so got it hits you. Oh, yeah. It hit me right in the, the knee. ball. Hit you. Yes. Yeah. Like square. Oh, you right said he's knee. sitting there screaming at your knee, but you didn't say oh, that it connected yes. with well, your back. Knee. To, yeah. Back to the quickness thing, you know. Um, yeah, you see I wonder why they leap like a cat and missed it. You know, nope, okay? nope. Just if you dead, use your glove, the knee. You know, and like I tried, use your glove and caught it. Yeah, that didn't happen either. Man. And then two innings later, the same thing happened, but it hit me in the thigh. <laughs> <laughs> I got hit twice, dude. I got hit twice in the same leg, within inches of each other. The one on the thigh, that one definitely left a welt. So I know my softball coach. He's listening yeah, to this. His name is Mark. Uh, shout out to Mark. Even after all my concerns of eventually getting hit, the inevitability of getting hit mm. uh, by a softball, it came he was true. he was so he was so good to just put his arm around me and encourage me. You know, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. Mm. It's happened to other people, but I'm sure it's probably not gonna happen to you. And he, you know, he, he coerced me and talked me into, you know, being a pitcher because he's a friend, you know, he just, he cares. So yeah, it happened. I can see old Mark in the dugout when that happened, (laughs) looking at the other, looking at the assistant coach. I told you, I told you, stop that ball. (laughs) You know, if they, if I wasn't so mad, a good joke would have been, that's the best defense you played since you joined this team. (laughs) Tony got two stops. <laughs> usually he's letting them stop. Tony. Usually he's letting the ball just fly right past him. Stop those. Man, what a what a move. What a move to pitcher. See, I told you. What good coach. Good manager. Yep. yep. Oh, Everybody's man. like, man, he's he's a sharp one, man. <laughs> he really <laughs> knows how to move him players around. <laughs> but I stuck in, dude. I've seen dudes get tagged and then just dip, dude. They're just like switching positions, like, yeah, I'm out. Not me, dude. My pops played softball my whole life as a kid growing up. And uh, this is back in the 80s, man, when you would, like, literally ride down a six-lane, you know, highway as a, as a as a small child sitting in the back of a pickup truck, <laughs> you know, with your buddies. Yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? On, on the way to watch our dads play softball. And then they had their games. And then afterwards, you put the baby in the, in the dashboard if you had to do something. You yeah. set your baby just right in the dashboard. Like, oh, just just lay here just for a minute. Lay here, you'd be all right. Yeah, man, they play every week, and me and my buddies, man, we would ride back in the truck and go, and then afterwards they go to a Seven Eleven. They'd all, you know, get some beers, man, and just you know catch up and laugh about the games. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, man, those were like some really fond, really truly fond memories for me as a yeah, kid. Yeah, man, the good old days. Like I can, oh, dude, I can hear the sounds and smell the grass, man, and you know feel like that. Feel that freaking wheel well in the back of that truck beating me, dude. I'm going down the road, you know. It's uh too too good, man. Well, cheers to softball. Cheers to softball. Cheers to resilient bodies. Uh cheers. Well, cheers to-, to stories about Samaritans. Ooh, hard shift. Ooh. Hard Ooh. shift. But I was but hoping for notice, a more of a did you notice the S's. Mm. Softball stories. Samaritans, dude. That's like an alliteration, like Baptist outline. There you go, man. You know what I mean? Like, there's like somebody out there right now is like, man, we should, we should talk to this dude about doing our sermon outlines for us. You get the, uh, we should, you know what we should do for each episode? We should award a, pa- <laughs> a pastoral moment award <laughs> where, like, you know, because each of us, you know, like vocationally, professionally, we're pastors and did ministry for a living. Okay. Um, we, we've kind of shed a lot of that, like cadence and approach and all the, yeah. you know, squirmy, slimy things that come with that, along with the good, for sure. We're not, yeah. we're not, you know, throwing the, we're baby not throwing out the salt bath. Yeah, at sure. everybody, 
right or all of it but yeah. every once in a while pastor tony and pastor russ kind of re- rear yeah. their ugly heads so i think yeah. every episode we're gonna we're gonna hand out an award a pastoral um a pastoral moment this pastoral moment I like it. We, what we probably should do, man, to see if our audience wouldn't text in like this was the pastoral moment. <laughs> and we'll collect we'll collect the votes. Yeah, we'll do it. And then so to everyone the, listening, the following episode will be like, so last week's award goes to Anthony Sorchi. And that's pretty much the Lark crew anyways, is just the constant steady busting of the balls along with, you know, the encouraging things as well. So do not let us skate. Hold no, us accountable. Don't. Do it. Point out our only flaws, on please. only on areas of good news, though. And please uh, just that was the best compliment we ever got, us. man, from the from the ministry world. Was that one dude at a conference a couple of years ago that we were at? That we were speaking at. He was hanging out with us. I won't I won't say his name, but um, what are his initials? afterwards? <laughs> no, <I> ain't going <laughs> there. That's an inside joke. <laughs> but afterwards, he says, "Uh, man, I really I really like hanging with you guys, and just man." So the stuff that you're talking about, like just, man, it's needed. And, but I just got to say, I feel like you guys are, you're like spooky serious about the good news of Jesus and all of life in that lens. And you're not serious about anything, anything else. else. <laughs> I was like, Maybe that's good. <laughs> so, I knew I was in the right place. I knew I had yep. found my tribe when that was yep. the uh, the observation. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I think I think this is good. So continuing in our parables of grace, uh, if you're just joining us, we're in, I guess you can call it a podcast series. We've just been for a long time. We've just wanted to do a concentrated focus and conversation yeah. centered around the parables. The parables uh, for us, for Lark, um, you know, have been, and they've been just a, a source of a lot of things, of joy, of, of good news, passing that on, light bulb moments, mm-hmm. um, encouraging moments, helping people find freedom, helping people get rooted in the love that will never let them go, uh, helping them see God, what God is like for the very first time mm-hmm. in light of even everything they're rejecting about God in church, or even everything they've been like raised with. Um, in regards to God in church and the parables have just been so beautiful. So, so, you know, personally meaning so much to us. So we're right in the middle of this podcast series. Um, We are focusing on what we're calling parables of grace. Mm -hmm. Uh, We did parables of the kingdom uh, when we first started, and now we're focusing on these parables of grace and we're coming to a parable today. That's actually, it's pretty well known. Uh, The title of it um, has made its way into popular culture, into just regular social, you know, conversation. It's just a term, um, the Good Samaritan. Even anyone who's not a student of the Bible, even anyone who wouldn't say, man, I trust in Jesus or I believe any of that will use the term Good Samaritan. So it's a familiar one, but sometimes a lot of hospitals out there called Good Samaritan. Yep. Yeah, it's a it's a familiar one. But sometimes that could be the challenge when things are so are so familiar. It's good because yeah. you'll have you might have a connection with it, um, but it's bad because sometimes when you think you know about something, that could be the that could be the thing that, that hinders you the most in actually taking a taking a hard look. Yeah, familiarity can be can become a very dangerous thing at times. For sure, and I think even like in Jesus's context, man, like we're because these are the parables we're unpacking. If you're new to this podcast, we really just been walking through these stories that Jesus tells about what God is like. Um, Cause that's ultimately what they, what they point to. And I, I would say disillusionment, man. That's kind of what, right. They bring disillusionment to the, to, to a lot of the ideas that we've picked up and a lot of the, the weights that have been placed around our necks in the name of God mm-hmm. and life and hope yeah. and church and love. And, um, I would say this one's, you know, particularly, man, like the familiarity, you know, with it, you know, can really, really set you off. Yeah, because Jesus is saying the opposite, bro, of what I what I was taught. Jesus is getting at something, bro, that goes way beyond anything I was handed in seminary, man, and what I taught for years within church settings. 
And when you oh. dive into this story, just, you know, news, <laughs> news flash, news alert, whatever it needs to be. Man, this one, like, this is the one parable where I'm like, bro, I cannot wait to unpack this because on one hand, it is just, it just brings an element of joy and awe, man, almost like no other parable. Yeah. And it's like, how the hell did we miss this? Yeah. But God's just that good, man. So I think he, before he we get our timetables. Yeah. Before we get into this, we've been focusing since the Luke 15 parables, lost sheep, lost coin, lost sons. And then getting into the unforgiving servant, which we titled the real F word. We did a part one and a part two. Um, I think like in the kingdom series, we kind of paused and did just a brief conversation about here's some handles that are helpful to understanding these parables. I kind of want to just briefly take a moment just to say just some, you know, just preface this conversation with a couple handles on these grace parables that I think will help frame and help us really land in a good place when it comes to the parable of the good Samaritan. And the first, first is this with the great grace parables and much of scripture, it grace only works in death and resurrection. Grace yeah. only works in death and resurrection. And if you keep death and resurrection, instead of maybe what would be the prevailing popular interpretation is like, um, the scripture is kind of chicken soup for the Christian soul. It's, it's meant for our daily encouragement or the scriptures. And Jesus is kind of like a cheerleader. He's meant to, you know, kind of be a good example for us on our way to becoming our spiritual self actualize our ideal spiritual selves, right? Ladder climbing, ascension, mm -hmm. progress, those kinds of things. But actually jet when you, yep. Jetpack, Holy spirit is a jetpack. As soon as you're redeemed, just, you know, behavior and, and progress and all mm -hmm. that is just kind of, it's assumed and expected and it's going to be real, real easy. Um, but really death and resurrection. And this, that, that principle, that, that kind of like that key to understanding what Jesus is doing is really going to, going to, it's really going to come out in this parable. And mm -hmm. the next one is this grace only works for the least last loss, little and the dead. Only when you understand yourself not as a spiritual superhero or an empowered person that's going to go ahead and like do these things and accomplish these things but someone who needs rescue as the least last lost little in the dead which we've already seen in luke 15 lost sheep lost coin lost sons right mm -hmm. um <clears throat> grace only works in death and resurrection and it only works among the least last lost little and the dead so with that in mind, I'm just going to go ahead and read the parable and we're going to jump in Luke 10, 25 to 37 for everyone who's following along at home. If you're listening to this in your car, don't have your Bible in hand while trying to read along. Just keep your eyes on the road. We'll read it for you. Just listen. Yeah, we got you covered. Got you covered. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to test. That's Jesus put Jesus to test saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Which of these three do you think Jesus is now speaking back to the lawyer? Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Oh, man. 
a lot here. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, because the more I think we'll see once we unpack this, um, we might find that we've got the wrong name for this parable. Yeah, that's not a surprise. Yep, yep. This might be another one of those that we that we uh, somebody misnamed, and the popular interpretation man is almost kind of undid the beauty that that Jesus is is presenting here. Yeah, and much so, like the prodigal son, you know, it's like yeah, the oh, prodigal yeah. son's a big piece of it, but it misdirects the eye. And yep. it, it causes you to think, oh, the, the biggest story going on here is this prodigal coming back yep. and being forgiven. And it's not. Yep. Yeah, no, it's, it's not the case. And just like in this case, we're going to find that the Samaritan isn't at the core of this, at, of this story. Yeah. So that sort of the backdrop in this, like even Jesus telling the story is, if you go back to like Luke nine, Jesus has already made known. He's already declared that he's on his way to Jerusalem. He has set his eyes for Jerusalem. Yep. He's made known that he's come to set the captives free. He's come to give his life as a ransom. He's, his mission is to die. Mm -hmm. Humanity's need is resurrection, not improvement. Right. Okay. And this is a, like, just, you know, just a mind bender, man, not just for the disciples, but for everybody around you. Messiahs do anything but die. It's like the way they're looking at this, right? You know, we just need somebody to help clean up, you know, clean up the act, man, get the world, you know, straighten up and fly. Right. And Jesus is like, no, you know, see back in the garden, um, there's this whole thing that was set in motion where some people who just like you and just like me, you know, just to be clear as in all of humanity, um, thought that they were possibly missing out somehow. They thought that there was this life of independence that could be found that there was this better thing that was over here. And so they set out to overcome their humanity, okay, to overcome their humanity, to become something else. Hmm. And it sets this whole thing like into motion where basically humanity looks to God and says, you know what, forget this. I got it, right? And I think we just have to always come back to that. Some, you know, some theologians call it the fall, right? Like, you know, the fall of, you know, mankind. I think the more accurate definition will be the leap. Because Adam and Eve took a leap, bro. They didn't fall, right? Like me, you know what I mean? In my moments where I've given God the finger and said, no, I got this. You know what I mean? And uh, right. there's it's like this when thing I trip up here. the stairs. Yeah. It just, yeah. <laughs> it's like more embarrassing. Like, no, this, that. Yeah, this, this is a leap. Okay. And the story of the gospel is the story of God seeing this and choosing to become human so that he can unite himself to us. Right. And bring about the very thing that we were created for. You don't need to overcome your humanity is what he's saying. Hmm. Right. But through my death and rest, through his death and resurrection, right. We find that, that we learn what it means to really be human, man. Hmm. So that's this story, which is why Jesus keeps saying my mission is to die, but they're not grabbing this. Hmm. AKA they, it's not just that they misunderstand what the Messiah is here to do or what God is actually after, or even what, you know, humanity really is. I think ultimately they they're missing their actual need. Hmm. Okay. And so that's what Jesus has made known. No one's grabbing onto it. And he's already made this known and they're on their way there. And while they're going, uh, Jesus sends out the disciples into this village with the Samaritans, right? Looking for a place to stay. And the Samaritans right, refuse. And for anybody who's just wondering, Samaritans were basically people in the past, Jewish people that had, basically intermarried with the Assyrians who had held them captive and in the process had denied their, their Jewish heritage and faith and started to grab onto this like, pagan worship, basically of like, you know, false gods. And so the Jewish people saw Samaritans as sellouts, the lowest of the low, you know what I mean? Not welcome to the table. Yeah. They're racially Samaritans, mixed and they're heretics. Right. Yes. So they're, they're looking at this and these Samaritans refuse a place to stay. And so some of Jesus' disciples, um, the sons of the thunder, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's this, this, uh, this that's WWE, out, that's an outlaw like, country band name right there, right? Like demolition crew, junior arsonists, as I sometimes say, are like, Hey, these guys, uh, these Samaritans, I mean, you know, they're heretics. Um, yeah, they, uh, you know, these unclean sellouts, they've refused you and us. I, I think we should go ahead and just set the village on fire. 
Just burn it. Burn it down. And of course, Jesus is like, man, you have com- like, once again, you're just completely missing all of humanity and all of its need and what it is that I'm doing. Hmm. So that's sort of like this backdrop, man. And at the same time, if you go through Luke, you have all these religious leaders in a sense. You have Pharisees, okay? You have scribes, you have Sadducees, and then you have lawyers whose specific job was the interpretation of the law. All right. So these guys are expert experts on the law. And right. none of them, none of them are grabbing on to what Jesus is saying. None of them are wanting to identify with this proclaimed right Messiah. None of them are wanting to let go of themselves and admit that, hey, maybe I've missed it. And that life is actually over here in this truth, that reality is here. And I bought a myth. I'm over here living in the matrix. None of them are willing to admit it. And so they're, in a sense, they're constantly setting out trying to trip up Jesus. They're trying to get him to say things, right, that they can use to, to basically to, to, to justify his murder. But uh, here's the yeah, thing. Yeah, that or like kill his influence or whatever, yeah. yeah. The core of it, though, man, is I feel like if you get to the heart of it, it's because ultimately, dude, he's what he's saying is leading them to choke, man, on their religion. Mm-hmm. They're choking, literally choking, gagging on what he's saying because it's pulling the rug out from under them. Yeah. It's removing everything they have built their this myth of their individuality on mm-hmm. this myth of progress. It's pulling it out from under them. Yeah. They're finding that they're just equally dead along with everyone else and in need of someone in the resurrection business. Mm-hmm. And so in this case, you've got a lawyer, right? Who's, who's coming to Jesus with that very, that very plot. But I think you just have to remember that you also in this audience have the disciples who were just thinking that they too were in the right. They too were on the right. You know what I mean? They were in the good company, man. They were part of the right tribe. Right. They're with Jesus. Mm-hmm. And these Samaritans that rejected, yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead and burn this down. <laughs> yeah, right. So that's the audience, man. I just feel like that's just such a cool thing to just remember and keep in mind. Yeah. Because uh, it gets yeah, hairy think, real fast. Yeah, we think Jesus is just challenging this lawyer. Mm-hmm. But really all around him, are people right. who don't understand this mystery, like who is actually standing right in front of them yep. and what the heart of God is really like. But the, but the lawyer is this center stage because he, he wants this smoke, man. He yep. wants to come right in the middle of everybody and trip Jesus up. And I, I think it's just very telling that um, after he asks this question and Jesus flips the question back to him and says, well, how do you see it? And he summarizes the law in a perfect way, right? Love the Lord with your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He's like, awesome. Do that, and you're going to live, right? Do that perfectly, and you'll live. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He asked the question, but Luke is sure to point out his motive. And he says, but he desiring to justify himself. And it's like, ladies and gentlemen, like, this is why this podcast exists. This is mm. why we have such a path. This is why Lark exists. This is why we have such a passion. We see ourselves in this lawyer. We know at For our sure. core is that garden story. We just seek to justify ourselves. We are self justification addicts. I think the best way to frame it is to yeah. put it in terms of addiction. We are self justification addicts. You referenced it earlier as we're all of humanity. To, we're trying to mm-hmm. overcome our humanity. Well, what's the best way you can overcome your humanity is to get to a place to say, like, you're good. You don't need any help. You don't need any rescue. Yeah. You don't need any dependence on anybody because you got it. You have enough knowledge. You have enough, right? You have a good religious resume. You have a good social resume, whatever it might be. We're just looking to justify ourselves. We're looking to find a way to just at the end of the day, be like, I'm good and others are bad. It's that Samaritan village story all over again. And we love, yeah. dude, as self-justification addicts, we love to free base, right? I'm, I'm using these drug terms. We love to just free base the behaviors and beliefs that make us feel right. Yeah. To help That's, us feel like we're enough. We're okay. We're worthy. We're addicted to moralism and all its religious and irreligious forms. And what's sad is that this parable that we're on the precipice of here is often mm-hmm. presented as this freshly packed brick of uncut do good theology that'll satisfy that itch. Yeah. 
oh, you want to justify yourself? You want a pathway uh, to be in the kind of person that God's going to pat on the back and give a big thumbs up to and just welcome you in because you crushed it in life? I Here. got a blueprint for you. Yeah, I got a blueprint. Here you yeah. go. Yeah, we're like... <laughs> you know yeah, it's like exactly. Like, I need this, man. Like, like I think, um, you know, as you bring that up, like, you know, looking back at the beginning of his initial question, what do I need to do? What, what must I do to inherit like, this? right there, dude? Just stop that. That's the human story. What must I do to fill in the blank? And his answer, dude, and Jesus, like, literally, as you already said, like, Jesus, like, oh, you, you know, the law, what's it say? You're an expert on this. And what we sometimes like forget or don't, don't know or realize is that when the lawyer responds, he's, he's, it, it, he responds with a Shema. You know what I mean? He responds with the, the summation of the law, the heart of the law, the core of the law that Moses spoke to in, in Deuteronomy 6, 4. Okay, at the core of all these laws that, that God brought up, these things that paint a picture of harmony on earth, something that shows you what true, genuine relationship with God and one another solidarity actually looks like, Okay. Um, the, at the core of it is, is loving the Lord, your God, right? And your neighbor, man, with, with everything that you are. And he's like, boom. You know what I mean? Jesus, I, but I love Jesus. What did he say? Do that. Think about this. What must I do? You know the answer. Okay. You know what righteousness looks like. You know what perfection looks like. You know what the law demands. And he's, he answers it perfectly. Sweet. Do that and you'll live. Mm -hmm. and, and in that, he knows this uncut brick, man, that he's looking for isn't, isn't going to deliver because it's never delivered. Because once he realizes, once he runs through that Rolodex, man, in his mind, once he starts flashing through just even at the core of his heart, man, and like why he's even there and asking this, mm -hmm. he's already broken the law. He's not there out of love. <laughs> Yeah. right for jesus or anybody else and so this dude's like oh man like secretly he's at a place because religion will never allow you to drop your mask and just be like i can't i know the answer jesus and i just said it and you said do it and i'll live but i i can't yeah religion won't let you do that man when and it's religion, all about what you do to justify you can't be honest about where you don't justify and on your way to being that kind of person you can't help but demonize vilify and remove yourself disassociate yourself oh, yeah. from others and you so this, this dude, anybody yeah so this dude does what most people who are on that self-justification track do right you're you're doing this you're literally like you're narrowing your circle to everybody that thinks likes lives exactly like, and loves exactly like you yeah and you're like the disciples with the samaritan village you want to burn the rest of it down because you think in removing these people the world will be better and so this lawyer and you'll soon, be right and you'll be right in doing that in the name right. of god let's remove right. these people right and yep. so um what this guy does is he he tries to he asks the question well who's my neighbor he tries to narrow he tries to narrow the circle Okay, so yep. love the Lord your God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind, right? And love your neighbors yourself. But who's my neighbor? Like, surely these people who have the same nationality, theology, and values as me, right? Yep. Yeah, dude, it's a, what do I need to do? Well, I know what to do. Do it and I'll live. Well, I can't really do that. I never have. That's, I've failed my whole life at this, if, if we're being honest. And so seeking to justify himself, Jesus says, because he knows what's needed. He does what every religion game does, man. Starts thinking through like a better, like the system that you're going to need. What system do we need? What system do we need to create that allows us the loopholes to get around what's actually demanded, to get around what's actually good and beautiful and truly at the core of the humanity that God originally created? What do I need to do to feel okay, to justify myself, to be enough? Yeah. So for this guy, his position is represented in these first two characters in this story, right? Yeah. Well, the, the story starts with a man who, who comes from Jerusalem and he's making his way down to Jericho, right? We're just going to assume this guy is Jewish and he gets, he gets taken off guard. He gets robbed. He gets stripped. He gets beaten and he's left for dead, right? 
So the very first character is a guy going from one place to another who gets beat pretty bad and left for dead. I don't know about you, but if you've ever seen a guy beaten so badly where he's left for dead, it's ugly, man. It's real ugly. Yeah, he's on death's doorstep. Okay. He's 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 beaten, he's robbed, he fell among thieves. It is a treacherous journey from where he went down to, right? Um, you know, like the journey that he's on is is a known treacherous track, dude. It's a known place where this can happen. And the only person who would be making that travel would be a Jewish person. So you you definitely have a a, a Jewish man, dude, who's at the point. He's on death's doorstep. That's the first character that Jesus starts to unpack in response to, well, then who's my neighbor? If this is what I need to do to inherit eternal life, and I know that I can't, so now I'm trying to justify myself. So I move the question to, well, who's my neighbor then? Maybe that's what we need to really interpret here. Mm -hmm. Jesus is like, all right, here you go. First character. So that's him. Yep. And then the Jewish man, or the lawyer, rather, um, his position is represented in the first two people who pass by a priest and a levite mm. they represent yeah. life grabbing onto self-justification religion law pull yourself up by your bootstraps i'm justified mm -hmm. by who i am what i do strict adherence to the law strict adherence to the rules and we come to find out that that approach um is of zero help is of zero it doesn't even allow them to interact with this half dead man yeah. in fact it requires them right i know you got some notes on this it requires them to pass yeah. by this dude yeah they can't touch anything that's unclean so again what i had mentioned earlier dude with like the shema the heart of the law because we won't just grab on to the simplicity of at all this hinges on love of God and love of other, right? You've got an entire system that God allows and then even uses where these guys go about creating an entire law system around, you know what I mean? In a way, like to achieve this, but at the same time, completely removes them from this. Think about that, dude that you set out with a desire to justify yourself and create a system to achieve it that actually keeps you from the very heart of it. Mm -hmm. That's what you have here. So you have some scholars who are like, yeah, man, like these guys couldn't touch it. So when Jesus mentions a priest and a Levi walking by this dude, like literally seeing this Jewish man, really quick, Jewish man. So you have Jewish priest, right? Think about this. You know what I mean? The Levite. These both of these guys have specific, unique roles within the temple system or within the law. All right. I mean, they're they're both that totally assigned to the whole sacrificial system. You know, what I mean, that goes on in the temple that they're convinced of as some instrument of salvation, which it's not. It's a it's a picture, it's something different. But that's what they're I'm just saying, like these guys are involved in this. And it's almost like they're so busy about their business of trying to justify themselves with the use of this law and the role that they play within the system that they cannot be bothered or hindered from taking the time to serve another fellow Jewish man mm -hmm. who's on death's doorstep. They're so consumed with trying to follow these things to justify themselves that they don't even have time to stop and do the very thing that's at the core of what it is that God's invited us into. Jesus is not playing around, man. Again, master storyteller. And I just feel like, man, that's, they fancy themselves as winners, man. They've got a status to keep and maintain. They can't be associated with this, nor do they need to be bothered with it. It has no bearing upon what they're trying to accomplish in the world. This lawyer is so close to the law. He's given his life in its interpretation. He holds a noble position, right? Yeah. In the Jewish societal rankings, along with the priests right. and along with um, the, the Levite. Levite. Yep. So it, like you talk about winner circle here, it is like when like totally like you're you're among the who's who at this point. Yeah. And so if there was a group that could say, here's what we did to inherit eternal life. This mm -hmm. is the people who can at least try to make a case. So with that in mind and that that that, that position, everything that they've held to are holding on to and believe 
absolutely not only hinders them, but forbids them to step down and enter into the grave situation of this man, this half dead man. So now here's the Samaritan enter the Samaritan, right? To this Jewish audience, he's the outcast, the nobody, the despised, racially mixed, theological heretic. He's been scorned. Yep. He's been rejected. I mean, even so, like, even when Jews were like traveling, they would just like completely go around this entire place yeah. to not even have to interact with these kinds yeah. of people. He's yeah. been verbally abused. I'm sure he could possibly have been physically abused. I mean, you're seeing yeah. everything play out even in our country, right? With the this side versus, versus this side. Things can escalate yeah. physically very, very quickly. This and they guy, were at each other's throats over it, man. Yeah. The Samaritan is familiar with the situation that this half-dead man is in. There's a connecting point there. The other yeah. guys can't, can't connect with it they won't connect with it. Um, they are, they have incentive to not connect with it and just pass by. But the situation of this half dead man catches the Samaritan's eye. He knows this. There's something here that he relates to. Mm -hmm. He's participated in this rejection. He's participated in um, this, this abuse, this, um, nope. this difficulty. And here's where, here's where Jesus enters in. If the story starts out that a man was stripped and beaten and left for dead, right? Yeah. Well, who do we know with his eyes looking to Jerusalem? The one who, and this is why you brought this up. And this is why Luke brings this up in his mind. He has his eyes, his mind, his heart set on Golgotha, right. the place, the hill of the skull, the place where he's going to be crucified. He know it. He knows it's coming. Death. And it's a dangerous his mission, trick. His, his death is looming. So here's a man who's stripped, beaten, and left for dead. Well, Jesus wasn't just stripped. He was. He wasn't just beaten. He was mm -hmm. flogged, right? He was stripped, beaten, flogged, crucified, and confirmed dead. So everybody in this parable, all these characters have to deal with this dead man. Yeah. They have to interact with the dead person. Yeah, all three have an opportunity to, to be a neighbor or not be a neighbor, right? The priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. Um, but, you know, like you look in John, you know, chapter one, like it talks about how Jesus came and his very own people received him not. Right. You know who doesn't recognize that this man that's beaten in his own door, death's doorstep is as a fellow Jew? The priest and the Levite. Mm -hmm. Right? And Isaiah, right? In chapter 53, talks about Jesus basically, you know, dying as a common criminal. That he himself would be unrecognizable, you know what I mean? And what would be done to him when he is stripped and beaten. Yep. When he falls, right, among thieves. He's the stone again, that the builders this, rejected. Yeah. They, you know, in their minds, like messiahs, messiahs don't die, man. So there you, you've got basically Jesus is you've got people who the whole premise of why they're having this conversation is centered around this idea of life, salvation. Okay. Wholeness, redemption, all of that. Put it all in one, one bucket. All right. That's what they're after. And Jesus is in a sense, like just revealing to them, like, man, you guys are so caught up in this system and what you need to do to inherit, to obtain this, mm -hmm. that you won't even, and do not even recognize the very Messiah who's right in front of you. Mm -hmm. You don't even realize that God himself has become flesh. He's taken on humanity so that he could unite himself to us in our humanity. And you don't even recognize him. And here he is lying dead. And not only do you not recognize him, you don't want anything to do with him. Yep. Remember, Bro, in, gra remember in grade it's a school, flip, man, on what you normally hear about this story. Remember in grade school, man, you so wanted to be part of the cool crowd. You yeah, wanted dude. to get to that table. 
that, and, as, that and as soon as you did, table. If, if you worked your way up that social ladder, bro, of sixth grade and you made your way to that table, you know, maybe you started off on the very fringe of it and then maybe you got to the center of it. And then all your, your friends that you once ditched and played with on the playground are like, what's up, dude? Like what, you know, like you're, you're being a, like, you're being a jerk, dude. Yeah. You're rejecting yeah, man, them. We'll, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later, man. I'll talk to you when we get on the bus. I'm, I'm, I'm busy right now. <laughs> this is a very, this is a very simple, um, very noticeable human phenomena that we're talking about yeah. here. When we fancy ourselves, when we imagine ourselves as winners, I mean, we don't want anything to do with losers. You know where I see this on social media? It's all that talk of like, uh, show me your friend circle and I'll show you your future. Mm, Get yeah. rid of toxic people. You know what I'm saying? Surround yourself by people who are more successful, you know, than you. What I've always found, it's like, so surround yourself by people who are more successful to you. Well, then wouldn't you be like the low man on the total pole in that scenario? Like, why are you going to assume yep. they're going to accept you? You know, yep. it's this whole thing of like, we just, we pass it by. We want, we never get past sixth it. grade. We never get past sixth grade. We want no. nothing to do with the label of loser. And no. yet grace only works in those who have admitted their death, who have admitted yeah. they lose, they've admitted that they're, they're little, they're lost, right? Yeah, because there's no need for grace apart from that. Exactly. So you'll ne that's why we're saying it only works. You'll never embrace the reality of what God has done. To bring resurrection to humanity, to unite himself to it. You'll never, it, you'll never embrace this grace until you realize, right? How in need of it you are. Mm -hmm. And so I think he's and, just letting this, he's letting this lawyer know, man, you, you, you want to do these things. You want to love God with heart, soul, strength, and mind. You want to love neighbors yourself. And you are right. If you do that perfectly, then you're going to get right. The gold medal of justification and right. You're going to be welcomed in to heaven's, you know, welcome through heaven's gates. Um, the problem is he, he, he's setting himself up. He knows, yeah. he knows he falls short. And so Jesus, like in most places, he's just trying to invite him into the beauty of bro. We can't, you can't do it. Yeah. You won't do it. Yeah. You haven't done it. Right. You're at, you're seeking to play games with an interpretation around who's your neighbor, because you know, the answer, you answered me correctly. I looked right back at you and said, great. Awesome. Do that. You'll live. Uh, right. That's why we're having this conversation. And yet at the core of it and at the core of your unbelief and unwillingness to just let go, man, to just die to this whole damn project of you mm -hmm. to, to, to just to, to die to this myth. You're completely missing the very reality of God himself doing what you've always longed for and need who's yep. right in front of you, yep. but you despised him. You won't recognize him. You won't slow down. You're so busy on your track to where you're trying to go. You won't even go over to the other side of the road to even meet him where he's at. Yeah. You won't identify with him. It's not safe. It's too messy. It doesn't fit within all this, this system that you've, that you've created. Now, really quick, whenever that starts to come up, everybody's like, well, wait a second. Um, you know, Russ, Tony, I've always been taught that man, like Jesus tells a story basically to drive us to a picture of what true goodness and love looks like with the Samaritan. Because, I mean, Jesus ends the story with talking about what this Samaritan did, what this outcast did to minister to this other outcast. Yep. What this lowly loser <laughs> did to minister to this other lowly loser dead on the side of the road. And then tells us to go and do likewise. So are you saying like, throw that picture out? I'm like, no, like that's yeah. still a beautiful picture of, yeah. of, right. Of loving, of loving your neighbor. That's a, that's a great example. But hear me when I say this, if the world was going to be saved by good examples and good behavior, that would have been done a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Jesus would have never needed to come and die. I mean, Galatians three says like, if righteousness could come by some you know, means of you walking and obtaining what the law demands, right? Done, dude. 20 minutes after Mount, you know, Moses came down from Mount Sinai, man, that would have been like finished. But the reason why we don't have hope in human resourcefulness and the reason why we say hope in human resourcefulness is always plan to spare 
is because our ability to know something and then our ability to actually walk in it are two different things. Mm -hmm. And so I love what I'm seeing here is like, it's not taking away the beautiful picture of what the Samaritan did by saying that the Christ figure in the story is actually the Jewish beaten man who's at the point of death that no one will identify with. Okay. Um, and I think Jesus makes that case by when you look at what the Samaritan did to serve this guy, like, I, I think we just read right through it and we're like, yeah, man, like, that's it, dude. There's the blueprint. Go do it. And I'm like, bro, look at the story. It's, what does uh, it's Jesus insane. Say? It's outlandish. Like even if, okay. So if you outlandish hold, is the best word, if you hold law in hand, and yeah. this thing is the motivating factor for how you're going to interact mm -hmm. with your neighbors. You are going to, you are going to check the list and do no more. You right. are going to do the bare minimum requirement to make sure that you check all those boxes, fulfill every letter of that law. And you are going to do no more. What we see in the Samaritan is like, it's almost like a law didn't even exist. It's like the, just the compulsion of his heart, like mm -hmm. the, the outflow of him connecting with this person who looks very much like him. He connects with this death. He connects with this rejection. He connects with this, this half deadness being unseen, so to speak right. by two people walking by noteworthy people. Right. And he connects with this and he does the most insane thing. He goes above and beyond. It's a, it's the kind of love. It's the kind of service that that law could never produce. It's like, yeah. it's like when Paul gets into the fruit of the spirit in Galatians, right? We're, to, we're, we're like talking for, we're far beyond law at this point. Paul's like, dude, the law, dude, no, it's the ministry of death. It's never yeah. going to, it's never going to um, get you to this place. You, you want to really talk about being a person of love, man, live mm -hmm. a life by the spirit, not by the letter because the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And so, right. and then you see how that happens, the pathway to that. It's not merely just, okay, I'm going to wake up this today and I'm just going to decide to be a good person. No, Jesus is constantly talking about what is the pathway, not the ascension up the hill to being the kind of person you want to be. It's the descension into knowing that you're lost. He who's been forgiven much loves much. Yeah. That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees who were so just scandalized, right? Right by this woman of the night who would come and crash this party and dump perfume and, and onto Jesus's feet and wash his feet mm -hmm. with tears and her hair in this embarrassing scene of worship. And Jesus just sat there and he received that because he is the King of Kings because he's worthy of that. And he looks at these Pharisees are so appalled. And he goes, he who's been forgiven much loves much. He who's been yeah. rejected much loves rejects much. Yeah, if you if you misinterpret this, man, you just basically said, okay, so then Jesus is contradicting himself because he's been making a case for everything that we're talking about, and faith and faith alone is is trust. Trust is at the heart of what it is to enter into relationship with God. Okay. And if you're not careful, you'll start to read this and put yourself in the story and say like, yeah, man, what Jesus is saying is like really level up, man, and go get it together. Then, then that, that lawyer who's like, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Keep this, you know, the answer. Uh, I can't. So well, who's my neighbor? Let's just try to create a system that, that way. And then Jesus tells like, like what it really means to be a neighbor. And we're thinking like, he walks away like, yeah, man, now I got a blueprint. And we walk away thinking, yeah, I got a blueprint. It's like, no, dude, that would not be in line at all with any of the parables that Jesus is telling. Yep. Judgment falls on unbelief in every parable and on unbelief alone. Yep. The story of the prodigal, right? Is not, it's not the story of the younger brother or the older brother, but what the father's like. And I think that's what we're seeing here is, is Jesus is showing you us, him, what he's like in this thing that's in us, that's keeping us from refusing to identify with that. The right? first he, thing what you, is it Hebrews 13 or 14 talks about, like, it's by our choosing to suffer with Christ that we find salvation. In other words, it's by our jumping into the death of Christ. It's the taking up of our cross. Mm -hmm. It's the admitting our death, that his death is our death and his resurrection is our resurrection because his life is our only hope of life. Yep. It's the letting go that we awake right to this. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's just sort of like driving this home. And 
you look at these, you look at this scenario, like you've got a Samaritan, first of all, it says that he binds up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, all acts of kindness to be sure. Um, but, but also uh, acts that any normal person would find extremely inconvenient, you know, just to be clear, distasteful, depriving even, not to mention expensive of both time, right, and resources, as Capeman says. He puts him on his own, right, on his own animal and takes him to this place where he can get help another inconvenience, taking him away from everything that he set out to do and try to accomplish in life. Kind of like these, right? Priests and Levites. Um, he brings him to an end, right? To take care of him. He doesn't get to stop at some hotel on his journey, dude, and kick up his feet, right? Pour a nice little bourbon man and sit by a fire and read a book. No, he spends his evening taking care of this complete stranger who's supposed to be his enemy, right? And then lastly, he heads down to the front desk the next morning. And he hands the guy a bill, not a bill, I'm sorry, he hands the guy payment and says, hey, whatever it takes, nurses, doctors, rehabilitation, helping him walk again. Dude, you start to add up the expenses of this. You're talking well, well over, let's put it like this, at minimum of someone being at death's doorstep, literally dying, okay, beaten to death almost, to coming back to full health, the care of that today, bro would be three to four times the average annual salary. That's the expense. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Right, but we just, we read through it and we're like, oh, there it is, man. That's the blueprint. It's like, no, man, Jesus is showing you something much deeper than that here. Yeah, we act like he busted out his canteen and like gave him a little sip of water and like, you know, yeah, say, stay, stick with me, bud. We called 911 yeah. or something. Isn't it, what did he say, uh, you know, good Samaritans are sued regularly in yeah, <laughs> today's right. society, right? You know, they're oh, like, by don't, the way, don't touch the body. You're going to cause further damage. And uh, let's just be clear. If you came home and, you're in, and said to your wife, hey, you know this guy that's our enemy? Yeah, I saw one of them. It's a complete stranger. He was in need. I went ahead and took out the visa, charged 110 grand to take care of him. Maxed it out. Yeah. Like, wait, wait, what? Yeah, you know that, that uh, like that's how you lose your that's how you lose your marriage <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when you show up get, with that story. You're gonna get divorced for sure. I don't think my my uh my uh wealth management guy, I don't think he factored right. that that uh you know impulsory uh, good deed into my uh for, the forecast of my financial future. Yeah. Um, well, it seems that by this good deed, you were 110% on to meeting your goal, and now you're down to 30%. <laughs> <laughs> So here's what Jesus is saying. Like, we don't want to be someone who has right theology, who's believing, you know, some things, at least in regards to what God has said, but isn't quite as loving as they should be. But over here, we have a guy who has denounced God and called him a liar, and has refused the teachings, right, of the Lord. But he's nice and kind to people. So maybe that's salvation. Like, that's not what he's, neither one of these examples align with what Jesus is driving home here. So when he says, go and do likewise, go and do likewise. I think what, he, what he's ultimately saying is like, the Samaritan, you know, isn't to be imitated in that he's, uh, like there's like some like moral uprightness in his behavior. And therefore there's a salvation that can come to you in this. Instead, what Jesus is showing is that the good Samaritan had the spiritual insight to press into the mystery of death, mm. the mystery of death. He had the spiritual insight into the bizarre working of the mystery of death. And dude, that is what the cross, the only place where our failures are recognized and redeemed in this entire world, the only permanently good news we will ever know. That's what that is. And that's how that works. So to me, this is a modern, perfect story, dude, for so many of us, myself included, that get so caught up in the religion of doing good and thinking that this is where life is, that it's found in overcoming our humanity and achieving these things. And then we're enough. Then we're worthy. Mm -hmm. We're justification addicts, man. And we're drowning in it, yeah. either in pride or in pity. But what really where life is found and what we've been invited to come and identify with is a dying Messiah who works in the mystery of his death, man. I think that's what the Samaritan had the insight for. 
Right. And I think that that's such a beautiful way to put it. And just to wrap this up, I think you need to see at the beginning of this parable, a guy Mm -hmm. who really wants to get it right. Right. Maybe he wants to trip Jesus up. Right. Maybe he's representing his buds. Like I'll go talk to him. I'll go challenge him. But at the end of the day, like most good Jewish kids, he just really wants right to be there in the end. And Jesus says, okay, you want to be there. You want to inherit eternal life. The first thing you need to consider is death. Mm -hmm. This is the conversation we need to have. We need to have a conversation about death. This guy wanted the resurrection of the Samaritans good deeds without embracing his death. We all want the resurrection, right? Of good deeds, a pat on the back, the assurance that we're in without embracing or dealing with death. You can't jump right from life to resurrection and bypass death. You can't do it. And all these things, all these things, Jesus is laying these little breadcrumbs, man. Right. Or a big moment like this with this, Mm -hmm. with this Jewish lawyer, but things like this, man, if they've rejected me, they'll reject you become like a child. Jesus said, we always want to point to these like positive kind of like Hallmark S kind of like positive means become nobody, (laughs) but we never, yeah. We never think through what that means socially and positionally. Like you're just an annoyance. You don't, you don't benefit this culture at all. You're just someone who's super needy, right? Yeah. If they rejected me, they're going to reject you. Become like a child. Here's another one. Take up your cross. Yeah. And we always, we're we're turning the electric chair, (laughs) we're turning these invitations to embrace death as challenges to avoid death. We're turning these invitations to embrace our death and to come to the place where the Samaritan already is because of just his place and his experience, right? And we're taking these as challenges for the, for the spiritually just fit to just avoid death. Yep. And th- sadly, this is how this parable yeah. is presented here. You want to avoid, you want to avoid um, considering your death and that you can't do any of these things. Cool. Here's the story about a good Samaritan go and do likewise. And you tell this parable without the nuance of the death conversation. Oh, and you know who never called the Samaritan good in the story? <laughs> the one that told it. Or the author. Think, think about that. Yeah. That's not in there. Life itself is found in recognizing, embracing, believing your death. And a path of religion will have you headed from one place to the next, completely ignoring all signals and all signs that maybe, just maybe, <laughs> you're not doing it, man. <laughs> you're not getting it right. And you will just pass by every signpost, everything that looks, feels, smells like death. And the invitation of God, for any consideration of this life and the life to come, is he sets you down and he says, first lay, we need to talk about death. Yep. Yep. The parable of the good Samaritan. The parable of the half dead, beaten, stripped, naked man. Some There's some hospital out there that might change it. Beaten and bloody Baptist hospital. <laughs> right. Yep. Left for dead, the Lark Community Hospital. There is no resurrection apart from death. Yep. That, that's the point that Jesus is driving home. Somehow, man, tie that into a name and there it is. Yep. There it is. That's the invitation, dude. And it's, it is literally life-giving. So to that, I say cheers. Cheers. Cheers.